So we've been talking about information versus revelation, right? And with the point about information versus revelation, how I got to this is I've heard people say stuff, and I know they don't know what they're talking about. They say, not y'all, because y'all know. I'm talking about everybody else. But they talk about the Word of God in a way, and I'm like, that's not even a scripture. You know, he moves in mysterious ways. That's not in the Bible, right? God is good all the time. It's not an actual scripture. It's components of different parts. That's a scripture. But see, what you have to understand is if you don't have the information or you only have information, but you have no revelation, when it comes time to use this information, you don't really know. So you're saying something. If you ever had a class and the teachers ask you to say something, you're like, it's, uh. But when you're confident and you know what it is, there's a boldness that comes over you. The point of this series is to put a boldness in you and a confidence in you so that you understand it. Information is the acquisition of knowledge through experience. Sometimes you go to church long enough, you have the experience. Hey, my God, oh my. You, you learn an experience. Some of y'all don't know what that means. You ain't been in church long enough, but give you two more years. Ay, 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 ay. If you put an ay, ay, ay on the end of an uh, you're doing something. I'm just letting you know, if you make the stank face and shake your head, you're doing something. I'm helping some of you. But what I have found is when that information has no revelation, you can do all that, but when you need God to show up and you don't understand God, you don't know how to trust in God, and you can't go into the next level with God, you just got information. But let's talk about the definition of revelation. It goes beyond mere information right? It refers to a profound or transformative disclosure. See, and when I get a revelation of God, I should be transforming. I should not be the same next year that I am right now if I'm getting a better revelation of this relationship with God, right? So, the idea now becomes, what do I do with the information, and how do I get to a revelation? And so, my challenge to you today is, information versus revelation, but I'm going to talk about this. Do you trust God enough? Not trust God, but do you trust Him enough? Can you be married and not have your spouse's code to their phone and still trust them? Somebody just snatched somebody's phone. Give it back. <laughs> Give it back. Do you trust God enough? Some of you give somebody some money. You have to ask them to count it back out in your hand. Count it back out. Five. No, give, me, give it all. See, your level of trust is dependent upon your relationship with the person. How many of you have people that are your friends with their family members? You would give them the key to your house. You would leave the door open. You'd be like, here, just go on in. But there's other people you'd be like, just wait outside. Y'all act so spiritual. You know you got two people right now. Don't go, uh-uh, just stay, just stay outside. When I get there, I'll let you in. Right? But do you trust God enough? And what I want to talk to you about is a little bit of last week, I was talking about this breaking point, right, where, you re where it references to a moment or a situation that causes someone to reach their limit. So what can happen sometimes with our relationship with God, we hit a limit because our relationship is hit a limit. Like, I trust God. I love God. But I hit, you know, you want me to start tithing on the regular. I hit a limit. Like, I can't. Mm. You want me to forgive this person who did this to me twice. I, mm, I just, I mean, that's kind of it. And what happens then, you can't get mad at God if he can't take you somewhere else because you're holding on to where you are. I know I'm going <laughs> to let it sit because we all like, whoo, I could have watched this online. Listen. <laughs> But the definition of breakthrough point is this. The difference between breaking over here to the point I'm about to break, but a breaking through is when there's a significant moment or event that marks a turning point. I want to help you understand something. Do not miss your turning point. Don't miss it. I joked about Brett Carter's birthday today. Give him Mr. Brett Carter, but I know he loved that attention. Give him a hand. If you can see him, he's in the dark going, just move on, Pastor. Please move on. But I would imagine if you go to talk to him after service and say, hey, it's your birthday, talk to me about some turning points in your life. I bet you he could say, oh, man, I can tell you when this happened. It was a change. It was a moment. 
You can find anybody in this room. You can find somebody online in your house. You can talk to them and say, when do you think you had a turning point? But there are these moments, but I've also known a missed moments. And I can look back and go, if I would have done this, then, right? But you know what gets in the way sometimes? It's frustration. Let me give you the definition of frustration. Frustration is the feeling of being upset or annoyed, especially because of inability to change or achieve something. Has anybody ever been frustrated about anything? That's the biggest amen I got this morning. When you are frustrated, it is, it is a, a, a feeling of, ugh, right? You're just like, and the interesting thing about frustration is a lot of times frustration is really environmental. It is based on the people around you that make you frustrated. Keep looking at me. Do not look at your family member. Don't point at somebody. Point at the fa- Don't do that. The frustration can really come from the people around you or the environments that is around you. So what can happen is you get frustrated because of really what's going on here, and you can take it out on people that are around you. True story, about three weeks ago, I was going somewhere to speak in the morning, and I'm usually a pretty on-time person. Like, I'm, I'm never going to be late to, like, speak or be somewhere. But I couldn't find this bag I was looking for because it had something in it I needed. So I'm kind of looking around, and what I found, it was under my jacket in my uh, closet. And I have this, this desk kind of thing in this chair. And I went to grab it, and it wouldn't come out. So I was tugging it because, you know, I could have taken my time and put the things I had in my hand down and moved some things around, but I didn't do that. So I got frustrated, and I was pulling, pulling, and I just, like, literally, just, I said, ugh! The chair that it was wrapped around that I didn't realize flipped up in the air, fell back to the floor, and broke. I looked at it, and I didn't even have time to clean it, so I'm running out to go do what I need to do. When I got back home later that day, I kind of forgot that I was that frustrated and that I broke it. And so now when I wanted to use that chair again, it was broken. Nobody's fault but my own. But I let the moment of being annoyed impact something that I actually wanted to use later. How many things are you frustrated about that you're making decisions in a moment of frustration that later when you actually want, when you calm back down, then you're like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have done that, I wish I would have done this. I'm talking about can you trust God enough, and I want you to think about frustration because what I believe happens is when we get frustrated, we make bad decisions even about our relationship with God. And then what happens is, then people will say, well, I thought you were praying and believing God for that. I was, but you forget to tell them about you breaking chairs and just say, well, God hasn't answered my prayer. But did you tell someone about the frustration point? Did you tell someone what you did when you weren't supposed to do? Did you tell someone, no, listen, God actually was doing his part. It was me. Or were you saying, because we're good about it. I don't know when God's doing it. I wish God would show up on time. When is God going to come through? God is like, if you would stop getting frustrated. Let me give you an example of what happened in the Bible. This is in the, in, in the chapter in the Bible of Exodus. So it's Genesis, Exodus, Numbers. These are, okay, some of y'all looking at me. That's, those are the chapters of the Bible. <laughs> you thought I was about to say Ray Ray after that. That is not a family name. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, y'all get it here. That's not what I was talking about. Okay, just to help some of y'all. Okay, so Exodus is exit right? This is a part of the Bible where it's talking about the children of Israel are leaving slavery, right? And Moses is leading them out. So Moses leads them out. You can read this in the Bible. He opens up the river. They they part the the Great Sea, rather. Um, They go on dry land, and all these wonderful things happen. Pharaoh has to let their people go. Now the people are disobedient, so they get themselves in a situation, and now they're in this wilderness. Let's pick up the story there. The whole Israelite community Set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses, who was the leader, and said, give us water to drink. And then Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? So Moses, the leader, it's interesting. When's the last time you prayed for your boss instead of yelled at him? I'm going to turn over here. 
When is the last time you stopped quarreling about your manager, your father, your mother, and prayed for them? Mighty quiet in this church. So Moses replied to the people, God, oh, basically what he's saying is, haven't you seen God show up? He keeps doing wonderful miracles. He keeps doing all these great things. We have nothing to drink, Moses. So Moses says back to the people, why do you quarrel with me? Why are you mad at me? So here's what happens. But the people were thirsty for water. Isn't it interesting how your current situation will put you in a situation where you forget God? Your current frustration, your current disappointment. So people say something like, I know I shouldn't say it. I'm just, but God needs, then don't say it. I'm not going to do, I mean, I just, I know I still love God, but no, no, then stop right there. Don't let your frustration put you in a situation. Say that with me. Say, don't let my frustration put me in a situation. Okay, so watch what happens. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses, and they said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. He has broken you free from prison, and you saying, why did you bring me out here? My leadership style might have been different in the Bible. Go back. You can go right here. Let me go this. Dig this row right back and ask Pharaoh for your job back. Go right that way. I tell God, I know I was born in a season for the right reason. So Moses is getting upset because the people are yelling at him, and he prays out to God. He's like, what am I going to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. So the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile. So when he was going to Pharaoh and trying to get his people free, he had a staff. And he kept going in front of Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And every time Pharaoh said no, God would do a miracle to shake them up, to make Pharaoh realize the power of God. And at one point, he told Pharaoh, let the people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, these are my people. And if you had time and you really studied this, it was really an, a, an economic situation because the slaves were making Pharaoh money. So if the slaves left, the economy system was going to break. Don't you think that's why the enemy's trying to keep you as a slave in a system so that you can't break free from it? I don't have time to get in that. Wait for our, our wealth seminars. But he says this. He says, take your staff, the one you use when you struck the water of the Nile. What happened when he struck the water of the Nile, he took this, he said, Moses, let him go. And, Mo and, and, and Pharaoh said, no. And the Bible says when he touched the water, all of the Nile, the Nile River, it turned into blood. Now, last week, I told you, sometimes you got to bring the remnant of your miracle into your next season. Right? So he has something in his hand that he's like, this once did a miracle. So now he's holding this, and God says, take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. What is your last stick from your last miracle? What's the last remnant of the last miracle that happened in your life? Do you have it in your hand right now? So he says to him, I will stand before you on the rock at Mount, he says, I will stand before you. God is saying this to Moses. I will stand before you. God is telling Moses, I will do the work. God is telling Moses, listen, take that staff. Now I need you to go and stand in front of the congregation. And he says, I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. He says, strike the rock. The water will come gushing out. Where's the water going to come from? Where's the water going to come from? Some of y'all are funny. It's okay. Just repeat after everybody else. Where's the water going to come from? <laughs> I don't know why y'all make me work so hard on Sundays. Just come ready. Goodness. Okay. So it says, then the people, watch, the people will be able to drink. So Moses, I don't have a rock right now. So Moses is up here, and it says, so Moses struck the rock as he was told, what? So you have to do what you were, not what you think. Well, I thought, mm -mm, that's not what he didn't ask you to do what you thought. He told you to do what you were told. How many of y'all had a whipping because you did what you thought? <laughs> that's all right. I know some of y'all had a, some of y'all went right then into the spirit. Some of y'all felt, oh God, I felt that. It says, so Moses struck the rock as he was told, and what happens? The water gushed out as the elders looked on. 
So water comes out of a rock. Why does it come out of a rock? Because he did what he was told. But now watch this. Now remember, I said Genesis, Exodus, this story that I just read you was in Exodus. Now we're in the next chapter. We're in Numbers. Now, if you read in this chapter, they're still in the wilderness. Anybody feel like you're still in the same situation you was in before? Have you ever felt like maybe I need to learn something to get out of the situation? So time has passed. They're still in the wilderness lost, and the same people are getting ready to have the same problem with their leader and with God. Have you ever felt like the problem that was over here is following you over here? Why are you so shocked that you got problems when the problems, the Bible says, the things are going to come. Though a weapon may be formed against you, it's not going to prosper. So why are you shocked when the thief, Pastor Jory just read this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Why are you shocked that a thief is coming? Why do you lock your doors in your house at night? Why do you put your triple alarm on your car? Beep, 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 click. You know there's thieves. If not, you just leave your doors open. You leave your purse sitting on the seat. Why do you not do that? Because you're saying, just in case the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So why are you shocked when the enemy is trying to come, when the Bible said he only comes to steal, he only comes to kill, he only comes to destroy? So now, here's they are again. They're in the same situation. And it says, in this first month of the year, the whole community. Now, nobody ain't got a testimony. Nobody remembers the remnant of God the last time. Not one person. There's nobody in your family saying, are we going to actually act like we don't, we know God done stuff for us? We're all going to act like it? Can you be the one voice in your community, the one voice in your family, the one voice in your company and go, well, listen, y'all, last time we had this, God did show up. It said, the whole community of Israel arrived in the wilderness of Zin and camped at Kadesh. And while they were there, Miriam died, who was his sister. And it says, and there was no water for the people to drink at that place. So they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. And the people blamed Moses and said, if only we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers. If you wouldn't have pumped me up to think God was going to do something in my life and just let me be a slave. That is a pitiful way to live. That you are literally saying, if you would have just let me die as a slave. And it says, and why have you brought the congregation of the Lord's people into this wilderness to die, Moses? Moses! you always doing it. Now, he then got water out the rock. Right? He, God uses him to part a sea and you walk across it but you have hit your limitation because of your frustration. You love God until everything is working fine, but the minute you got to stretch a little bit more, I don't know if I really need to go to church that much. I made it through COVID online. Okay, great. What are you frustrated about that's putting you in a situation I'm going to get in your grits right now. Listen, some of y'all, because you're not married yet. Y'all hear that? That's a mouse in the back saying, you better preach. Because everybody else is quiet. There was one mouse there. Why have you brought the Lord's congregation of the Lord's people into this wilderness to die, Moses, along with the animals? What kind of leader are you, Moses? Don't never bring nothing. You ain't got nothing. No Lunchables, nothing. Now watch this. Frustration. Now who's, who's complaining? The people are Moses and Aaron. Who's complaining? So the people are complaining. And it says, why did you make us leave Egypt and bring us out here to this terrible place? You, you forgot what it was like to get slapped and beaten? See, some of y'all forgot what it was like when the devil was slapping you around and controlling your life. You couldn't sleep. You couldn't eat right. You was losing all kind of weight. You was getting fired from jobs. Nobody gave you anything. Now, you forgot about that. And it says, and why did you make us leave Egypt and bring us here to this terrible place? This land has no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates, and no water to drink, Moses. We ain't got nothing, Moses. 
And then Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle. So sometimes you got to leave folks and go to church and pray. There are some Tuesdays, y'all don't know, I'm in here like, hey, Jesus, these people. No, no, I'm just playing. I'm playing. And it said, and Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff, the same remnant of the miracle that you used over here, and take the remnant that you used the last time I told you to get water. Take that one and bring it with you now. See, the question to me, right, to you right now is, what are you bringing in this current problem? And if you show up in this problem with nothing, you forgot who he was. But what was the remnant? The thing I'm holding is the last job offer I got. The thing I'm holding is the last time they told me I was going to die and I yet live. What I have in front of me is the report card that said I was going to flunk out, but I still made it. What is the remnant that I bring in this situation to remind myself to say God showed up last time? And he says, go bring that stick again this time. And he says, as the people watch, now listen to this. He says, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. Wait a minute. So although I bring the remnant of the miracle from the last time into this new season, it does not become my idol. Meaning, the only way I know God to show up is this particular way. The challenge for us as Christians is this. We can get caught up in what I'll call faith superstitions. It's when I come and sit on this side, and they sing that one song, and when they do this, and if sister so-and-so say something, that's when stuff work out. I grew up with people saying this. No, I just want so-and-so to pray for me. Why? Because it works when they pray. They don't have no power, right? But you've got caught up in a, in a tradition. Now, listen, I'm going to be very careful because I don't want nobody getting mad. But I, I question sometimes things we do. Is it because God is saying do it in this season? Or is it a tradition that works and now we're trying to do it again? And God's like, I'm not in that. God is the source and the strength of my life. Right? So, but God told him, listen, bring the stick with you. Bring, bring the last thing with you. But I don't want you to use it that way this time. So don't go over here and start hitting the rock. He goes, I want you to speak to it. And I'm going to gush out water again. Remember I talked about information versus revelation. Can anybody agree that if you get water out of rock, it's a miracle? Right? So the thing that gets me all the time is, well, we already know he's going to do the miracle. But you're questioning, like, how are he going to do it? did, Did you know how he got water out the rock the first time? See, okay, let me, give you, let me give you a break it down. How many of y'all know how a CD player works? Other, no, uh, put your hand back down. Other than you putting the CD in and clicking the button. I'm talking about what actually happens on the inside of the machine. You know you don't know. You put that in the back because they we go, yank, yank, yank. You be like, I don't know. Five of y'all right now are asking somebody, what is a CD player? <laughs> My point is you have information about stuff. How many drove a car here? If you go right now and don't start, you're going to be coming back here, Pastor. You want to come pray and walk, walk around it with me? <laughs> you got information, but you have no revelation of how the thing works. See, the situation now is Moses has got caught up in information. But God is trying to bring a revelation, which is Moses. It's not the stick. It's me, Moses. It's when you're obedient. It wasn't the stick. It was because I told you to put the stick in the water, and then it turned to blood. I told you to hold the stick over the ocean, and then it parted. It wasn't the stick, Moses. It was the obedience. So now he's pulling it, and he's saying, this time, listen, don't hit the rock. Speak to it. But Moses' mind is on tilt. And you know what else Moses is? Moses is frustrated. These doggone folks, I done brought you and your family out. So none of y'all don't nobody, don't nobody know Moses, huh? Don't nobody know more, right? Okay. So I ain't do nothing, right? I said, that's my version. That's my version. But I think most of so y'all don't know me. Ricky. Ricky, you don't remember me? Rick, you don't remember me when I got your family out? Two donkeys, remember that? 
Because you know how people get when they get mad, you go back and say everything. So when I fed y'all at the house, y'all don't know nothing about that, though. You know how people get, because they get short memories. Right? So Moses is so frustrated that he goes, you will provide enough water. Wait. As the people watch, speak. So what was happening is, this wasn't even just about Moses. Moses was supposed to demonstrate a behavior so the people could see there was another level to God. The people were supposed to see God is not stuck. Can I tell you something? The reason you're challenged right now and what worked before is not working right now is because God wants people around you to see you're not lucky, you're blessed. Pastor, it usually works. This is usually where things work out. And God is like, no, 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 because see, people think you've been lucky. But I need them to understand if they get into obedience just like you get into obedience, everything will change. But you got to be a part of this. But you're frustrated. So Moses is mad. Moses heard the instructions, got the information. So Moses did as he was told. He goes and gets in front of the rock, and it says, he took the staff from the place where it was and kept before the Lord. So he goes and gets his stick. He's like, yep, God said bring the stick. But he told him not to use it to hit it. Then he and Aaron summoned all the people. Everybody come here. And then he, this is just right here. This was a tip Moses was upset. Because this is what he said. He didn't say, good morning, congregation. He said, listen, you rebels. And I don't know why I feel like he had this walk. Listen, you rebels. So y'all, y'all, don't, y'all want to see water. Y'all want water. And he says, listen, you rebels, he shouted, must we bring you water from this rock? This is what's funny. Now, Moses is talking for God. Must me and God do this again? God didn't say, do none of that. Now, I can't go into this, but there's a comedian who's shorter than me that a lot of you know, and he was telling a story about he's going to school, and his mom said, the teacher had said a curse word. No, his mom said, Go tell the teacher I said this. But there was a curse word inside what his mom told him to say. And he said, I just want to be real clear, mom. Are you saying say it exactly how you said it? And she said, yes. He said, but you had a curse word in there. And she said, yes. Go tell. I don't want her to know. So the kid went back to school, and he told the teacher, he said, my mama told me to tell you this. And he said, you bling it, bling, 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 bling. They called his mom. His mom said, he said, what? His mom said, I said, say one word. He said, it just came out, mom. It just came out. My point is, do what God told you to do. Don't add nothing to it and don't subtract. (laughs) Moses said, must we bring you water from the rock? Mad. Then Moses raised his hand, and he struck the rock twice. Like, that's double disobedience. The first time, God said, hit the rock once and water came out. This time, he said, don't hit the rock at all. Speak to it. But because Moses was frustrated, he hits the rock twice. And water gushed out. Let me tell you something that I heard and it really stuck with me. Early, I'm going to say early in my preaching or whatever. But somebody said, don't get caught up in thinking you preach that well, because sometimes it just might be grace. Meaning... God is going to give the people what they need, even if I'm acting a fool. So I was like, well, let me make sure I'm not acting a fool. So he still brings water, and it says there was water that gushed out, so the entire community and their livestock drank. So you would might think at the moment, well, look at another blessing of God. But watch what happens next. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me. Remember, I said, do you trust God enough? To demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I'm giving them. Because he messed up in that moment of, mm, don't mess up your life because you're frustrated. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Don't go off at work. I'm about to, you're not going off nowhere. Hush your mouth. They got one more time. They got 15 more times. You hush up. You hush up right? Don't miss what God is trying to do in your next season because you're frustrated in this one. Moses now has done all this work all these years, gets the people free, brings them to the wilderness, and God says to him, you will not lead them to the land of promise because of what you did right here. What are you facing right now that's frustrating? Who's getting on your nerves that you're about to go off on and miss your blessing? 
Somebody just pointed somebody, stop it. So I'm going to give you two quick things. Do you trust God enough? Two examples of how to trust God. So get your phones ready because this is how you actually turn this into work, right? Like, well, how do I do this? That was great. I understand it. I'm going to do this in two minutes or less. Number one, lean not to your own understanding. So how do I trust God enough? Don't think what you think. Don't lean to your understanding of things. Well, it seems like it should work this way. No, you go off of what God said. Why? Because here's what the Bible says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. For anybody right now who's saying, Pastor, I'm a little lost. I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Where's my musicians? Come on, y'all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways. Not in the ones that are comfortable. Not in the ones that you already know what to do. But go to God with everything right now and say, God, I'm acknowledging you. What do you want me to do? How should I do it? And if he says, don't hit the rock, speak to it, speak to it. If he says, don't send the email, don't send the email. If he says, buy lunch with the person that's getting on your nerves, buy them two lunches. Bless the Lord. I know you love that. And he shall direct your paths. So I wanted the team to come up because I wanted you to understand something. When we are singing songs on Sundays, it's based on the word. So there's a song that we sing. Can you guys hit it? Trust in the Lord. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Say it again. Trust with all your heart. Hey, hey one more time. Sing again. Trust with all your heart. And lean not. Here's what it says next. Hey. Trust. Hey. Okay, hold on one second. Hold on one second. So the song actually says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then it says, lean not. What? I will hide your word in my heart. Now listen, the reason I'm doing this for those of you who never make it to praise and worship. I'm not judging you. I'm just helping you understand something. There is a process to this. We sing the word so it's in your heart. So by the time we get ready to preach, you already saying, lean not to my own understanding. I will hide your word in my heart, is what the Bible says. So I need you to understand, in this season, while you're trying to be more obedient, you may have to do some stuff you didn't do. Well, I don't usually make the praise and worship. I'm waiting for them to sing this kind of song. I want them to do that. Boo boo, you got to get everything you need right now so that you don't find yourself speaking to rocks, that you, I'm hitting rocks that you're supposed to speak to. So what I'm encouraging you to think about is that. Okay, you can stop. You can stop. Last thing it says, the second thing I want you to see is this. That song is called Hide the Word in Your Heart. Number two that I want you to work on is don't worry. Somebody say, don't worry. Say it loud like you believe it. Don't worry. You know why? Because this is what the Bible says. Which of you worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Basically, there's another translation that says, for those of you who are worrying, how is it going to help you tomorrow? He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. Lilies are flowers that grow in mountainsides that people will never see. And do you know that God puts enough sun on them and enough water on them every day for them to flourish and shine and grow? Nobody's ever going to see it. But it says, but how they grow and they neither toil nor spin. The lilies aren't out there going, can you do something, God? The lilies know God's going to come through. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon was the richest man in the Bible. He had jewels and diamonds. And what he's saying is what he had doesn't even compare to one lily that God takes care of. But here's what it says after that in 30. It says, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, ye of little faith. So this part of the song says this. How 
much more does he love you? How much more? Does... Sing it again. If he dresses the lily with what? With, with beauty and splendor. How, how much, much more? How much more does he love you? Keep going. How much more does he love you? If he watches over every, every sparrow, how much more does he love hey. How much more does he love you? If he dresses the lilies, come on, with beauty and splendor. How much more? How much more does he love you? How much more does he love you? How many crouches over? Yeah, he watches over every sparrow. How much more does he love you? How much more does he love you? How much more does he love you? How much more? Listen, listen to this. Until this Bible becomes real to you, this world is going to slap you around. Your circumstances, situations, challenges are going to take your joy every week. Every time you're up, one email can take you down. But then when you remind yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If he says he's watching over the sparrow, how many of you know that song? His eyes on the sparrow, right? It's basically saying that if he's watching over birds, how much more does he love you? How much more does he love you? How much more does he love you? Let's start from he dresses the lilies. If he dresses the lilies, if he dresses the lilies, if he's going to do that with beauty, how much more? How much more? Hey. How much more does he love you if he watches over every sparrow? Every sparrow. How much more does he love you? How much more? All, All I want you to think, think about, about is this. When, when you, you get, get frustrated, frustrated, can we be honest? honest how many of y'all are frustrated right, right now with something, something in your life? life? A, a person, person, a job, a situation? A situation. This word was to come to give you hope and say, I'm going to speak to this thing this time. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't do what you did last time. Because you're going to put yourself in a situation where you never get to your land of glory. What you have to do is do something different in this season. Okay? When this diagnosis comes, this time you speak to it and say, well, God, I'm believing you. Whatever God says to do, do it. Come on, let me say that again. Whatever God tells you to do, you do it. 